Good evening, everyone. I'd like to uh, introduce myself. I'm Karina Nielsen, and I'm the director of the Romberg Tiburon Center. I'd like to welcome you to um, San Francisco State's Romberg Tiburon Center for Environmental Studies. Um, we are San Francisco Bay's Coastal Science Center. Um, we, our faculty and our students, collaborate with two of our on-site partners that you may not be aware of, but we work together with uh, NOAA's San Francisco Bay Estuarine Research Reserve. And we also work in partnership with the Smithsonian's Institute's Environmental Research Center, who are both on site here. Um, and our work together um, is, we work together in experimentation, innovation, and education to support healthy and sustainable coastal ecosystems. Um, we are very, very pleased this evening to be able to bring you this high quality public program in marine environmental science to Marine, Marin County. Um, we bring programs that are accessible, informative, and timely. Um, however, we could not sustain, sustain these on our own, and we are very grateful to Richard and Barbara Rosenberg for their generous support of our public programs. Thank you very much. Including, including not only these spectacular public forums, which we have twice a year in the fall and in the spring, but also coming up on Saturday, April 25th, our Discovery Day open house from 1 to 5 in the afternoon, where we hope you will join us for the day with your friends and your families uh, and try on being a marine scientist for the day. Okay. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we have some very special guests in the audience tonight. We have uh, President Les Wong of San Francisco State University. Welcome. We have his wife, Phyllis Wong, here as well. Welcome. We also have the Vice President for University Advancement, Robert Nava, and his wife, Kathy Nava. Welcome. And uh, the Dean of the College of Science and Engineering, Sheldon Axler. Thank you very much. Um, before I uh, introduce tonight's speaker, oh, and I'd like to acknowledge, I'm sorry, our wonderful advisory board, many of the members who are here in the audience tonight, if you could please stand, if you're a member of our advisory board, I'd like to give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, though, I'd like to introduce you to Barbara Rosenberg, who would like to share a few words of welcome with you. Barbara, please. It gives me great pleasure to be here to welcome you to um, what we think is the greatest treasure in the Bay Area. Um, it's wonderful to see so many uh, um, friends of long standing rather than old friends and new people who are here. It's our honor to uh, be able to have sponsored uh, the Rosenberg Institute. Um, we think the choice of Karina has been stellar um, and the move forward has been amazing. So uh, we invite you please to extend welcomes to these forums to friends um, and make sure that you bring as many people as you can to the wonderful, wonderful programs uh, at Romberg. So thank you very much for giving us the privilege and the honor to be able to do this. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And, oops, inadvertently, inadvertently advanced. Okay, you, you, got, you got a sneak preview. All right. <laughs> Um, tonight, I'd, I'd like, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Levin. Dr. Lisa Levin is director of the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation Biology. Um, she's a biology section head and distinguished professor and Oliver Chair at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, part of the University of California at San Diego. She received her uh, undergraduate degree from Radcliffe College and earned her PhD from Scripps as well. Uh, she spent nine years as a professor at North Carolina State University before she joined Scripps in 1992. Um, 
Her research expertise includes the biodiversity of deep sea ecosystems, including those based on chemical rather than light energy, which some of you may not be fully cognizant of, but you will learn maybe a little bit about uh, at some point soon. She also um, studies naturally occurring oxygen minimum zones. Those are low oxygen zones in the ocean where there are special life forms that are specifically adapted to that. Uh, she also studies ocean deoxygenation, which is one of the concerns about climate change, along with ocean acidification and their influence on upwelling ecosystems like the one we have here off the coast of California. Uh, she also studies invasive species and restoration uh, and how they affect coastal and wetland ecosystems. Her deep sea research has been conducted over the past three decades on the margins of the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic oceans. Um, she has used ships, submersibles, and remotely operated vehicles, or ROVs, as they're called in the discipline. Um, and she's participated in over 35 oceanographic expeditions around the world, served as chief scientist on half of these. She has edited numerous volumes on deep sea biodiversity. She's been an editor of many prestigious scientific journals and served as an advisor, scientific advisor to many committees. Um, and last but not least, and especially in light of her top topic tonight, she's the founder and co-lead of the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative, and I think that we have some flyers in the back of the room about that if you're interested in learning more. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Lisa Levin. I am hoping this is working. Sorry. Okay, can everybody hear me? Is, is this microphone working right here? Okay, great. I need the pointer. Yeah. So thank you, Karina, for that nice introduction. I'd like to thank you all for coming out to listen. I'd like to thank our distinguished guests for being here, and especially Richard and Barbara Rosenberg for making it possible for me to talk to you about a subject that I'm actually very passionate about and that I love talking to public audiences about, and that is the subject of deep ocean industrialization and what it means for biodiversity. So let's begin uh, with just a description of what do I mean by the deep ocean. This is arguably the largest habitat on Earth, and I'm talking about the region that is greater than 200 meters. The deepest spot on the ocean is something just short of 11,000 meters. So this is a tremendous depth. The deep ocean covers two-thirds of the surface area of our planet, but much, much more of the habitable volume on this planet. And as a result, um, because it is so vast and much of it's very remote, we haven't really seen very much of it. We've seen less than 5% of the deep ocean floor, and this means that most of the species in the deep ocean, and in fact in the ocean in general, remain undescribed. So what I'd like to do uh, this evening is tell you about how our understanding of biodiversity in, in the deep ocean has changed in recent years. I'd like to talk about why we should care about that biodiversity, the functions and services that it provides to us, and then uh, really spend much of this presentation about um, the growing human footprint in the deep ocean and why this has created an urgent need for stewardship. So our research, the study of the deep ocean, really began in the 1860s, I would say. And for the first 100 years, we had major expeditions. Probably many of you have heard of the Challenger expedition in the 1870s. Um, we sampled the deep ocean from, remotely from surface ships for that first 100 years. And the picture that emerged was one of a very cold, dark, deep sea subject to very high pressures. The pressure increases one atmosphere for every 10 meters. So say 4,000 meters, we have 400 atmospheres of pressure. Uh, and we thought, we, we knew much of the deep sea was covered with mud. We thought it was very homogeneous, very stable, and very food poor, that the animals down there had little to eat and that it was virtually a desert. That was the picture that emerged up until, I would say, the, the uh, 1960s. And over the last 50 years, really, our understanding has changed 
dramatically about understanding of biodiversity in the deep sea. And this is the result of the development of a host of new um, different types of exploration tools, including multi-beam sonar, acoustic tool. So the sonar allows us to map the deep sea. Acoustic tool allowed us to see bubbles emitted from the seafloor or to watch animals migrate up and down. We have human-operated vehicles or submersibles that have allowed us to look directly at the deep sea. We have remotely operated vehicles also have allowed us to look. We have camera sleds towed and now um, autonomous underwater vehicles. So we have this whole slew of instrumentation which has allowed us to actually take a look at the deep sea and image and map it. And what have we learned? Well, first of all, the deep sea is not a large, flat, mud-covered seafloor. Um, and we've discovered that there are literally tens of thousands of seamounts out there. These are underwater volcanoes. Uh, and they are covered with dense, lush gardens, essentially, of filter-feeding animals, like the black corals you see here. We've also discovered that fish like to aggregate on seamounts, and so we have huge aggregations of fish like the orange roughy, and we've established big fisheries for these. Orange roughy you can find in your grocery store or on, you know, on the menu in your, in your restaurant. We've also discovered that seamounts are covered with uh, crusts that are rich in cobalt, titanium, nickel, and a host of other minerals. This is what these look like. Sometimes they're called cobalt crusts. And there's interest in mining these now. So we're, we're taking fish off seamounts. We're starting, we're thinking at least, about mining seamounts. Now the fish that are out there on the seamounts and in much of the deep sea turn out to be very, very old. Typically, these are from average ages that fish might be 100 or 150 years old. They grow very, very slowly. This means when you remove them from the ocean, they really don't, the populations don't grow back. It's almost like mining them. Um, but these fish, in fact, are babies compared to the corals that are on seamounts that are sometimes trawled up or dredged up. The corals can be thousands of years old. So they might be, say, three or four meters three or four feet high and many thousands of years old. So the animals in the deep sea can be very slow growing and very long lived. We've discovered with all our mapping tools that there are hundreds, probably thousands of canyons cutting our continental margins, also covered with a wealth of biodiversity, rich marine life. These are also repositories for um, organic matter, which eventually turns into oil and gas. And we're now interested in mining oil and gas out of some of our, our canyons. Uh, we've discovered that many of the animals in the deep sea form their own habitats. It turns out that there are deep water corals that live independently of sunlight, and they form massive reefs many miles long. They're especially abundant in the North Atlantic. Uh, and these form habitats and support many other different kinds of organisms. So they support the biodiversity down there. We've also discovered that there are massive sponge reefs that form big habitats, sometimes fueled by methane. And both coral reefs and sponge reefs are now known to provide nursery grounds to some of the important fish that we harvest commercially, like, for example, rockfish. So these are all margin habitats, often uh, occurring along continental margins. But out in the ocean, beneath the least productive parts of the sea, in the central gyres, we have vast fields of manganese nodules. These occur at three or four, sometimes 5,000 meters. These are potato-sized nodules that are rich in manganese, nickel, copper, cobalt, and other earth metals, and there's also interest in mining these now as well. And I'll come back to this. We've discovered in, in the last 40 years that there are entire worlds, ecosystems out there living without sunlight, relying on chemical energy rather than photosynthesis and energy from sunlight. The first of these to be discovered were the hydrothermal vents. And these communities are fueled by microbes using the oxidation of sulfide and methane. So they're using chemical energy, and these microbes sit at the base of the food chain. 
and they're either free living or they're living inside some of the animals as symbionts, for example, in these giant tube worms or on the crabs you see there. Now at hydrothermal vents, uh, seawater is circulating through the crust and it spews out very hot. And when it hits the cold seawater, it forms this smoke you see here, but it precipitates massive sulfides. And these sulfides are rich in copper, gold, silver, zinc, other elements that, again, there's now interest in mining these off the deep sea floor from hydrothermal vents. Another type of ecosystem that that's fueled off chemical energy are methane seeps. These occur in all these blue areas you see here uh, where there are gas hydrates, frozen methane buried on our continental margins, and as that dissociates, it fuels big ecosystems with tube worms and mussels, much like the hydrothermal vents. And then there's some really wonderful, iconic animals like these dancing yeti crabs that only at hydrothermal vents, and they're actually farming bacteria on their claws. They wave them to expose them to hydrogen sulfide, and here you can see eating the bacteria off their claws. Just an example of one of the strange kinds of creatures in this wealth of biodiversity that we have discovered down in the deep sea. Um, Karina mentioned that I, I like to study oxygen, and some of you heard me talk about this earlier today. Uh, we've discovered that the water column is not homogeneous, but it is filled with different kinds of water masses. Some of them are low oxygen water masses, where you see the blue here. Um, and we've discovered that there are whole ecosystems adapted to these low oxygen conditions. And also we found that the bacteria that occur uh, in some of these oxygen minimum zones on the seafloor uh, sequester and precipitate phosphorites. And there's now interest in mining these as a fertilizer source, and I'll come back to that as well. Now, probably the largest deep ocean habitat is the deep pelagic. This refers to the water column. This is the least known, least studied, but we do know that it's probably home to the largest migrations on Earth. There are massive amounts of, of crustaceans and midwater fish that migrate up and down 1,000 meters every single day. Um, we know that these species are food for the fish we do harvest commercially. Uh, but there's an amazing wealth of biodiversity out there that hasn't been discovered yet. We simply haven't had the ability to look at most of the deep pelagic ocean. Okay, let's see if I, I'm not sure did this, the movie show there. Um, so, so why should we care about all of this biodiversity? Well, I would say that over the last half century, we've also discovered that these organisms provide a variety of functions and services of importance to us. And of course, I've just been talking about what we call the provisioning services. These are um, the extraction of living and non-living uh, resources that have a market value that we can sell and get money from. So fish, shellfish, oil and gas we're taking from deep water. And we're just beginning now to look at pharmaceuticals and industrial agents from deep water. But there are many other kinds of, of functions uh, that go on down there that don't really have a market value. And I would put the support functions in that category. Um, the deep sea provides habitat, uh, food web support, refuge, nursery grounds for fishes. Uh, it, it provides a whole slew of regulating services. These are things like the sequestration of carbon. The ocean takes up about a third, uh, just under a third of the carbon that we emit into the atmosphere, and much of that is buried into the deep sea by the carbon pump, we call it. The deep sea also provides a lot of nutrient cycling that's needed to keep the planet to the ocean healthy and the planet healthy. We can also think about the biodiversity as a resource, um, as, as an important function, providing a potential genetic resources, most of undiscovered, providing biomaterials. But perhaps most important, it provides the raw materials that is going to allow life in the ocean to adapt to changing conditions. And we do know that the ocean conditions are changing. Now, there are many other kinds of services and functions. Um, the deep ocean is home to a considerable amount of scientific research, and there are thousands of scientists who make a living studying it. 
The deep ocean is home to our communication cables that allow us to have internet pretty much everywhere. Um, it's home to, it has provided a tremendous amount of artistic inspiration, both in the form of literature, movies, um, artwork, and so on. So there are many valuable functions and services provided by that biodiversity in the deep sea. But none of it is really pristine anymore. And I would like to talk a little bit about the deepening influence that people are having, um, both in terms of climate change, which I'll cover just very briefly, but also um, in mainly in terms of ex extraction activities. And I call these changes industrialization of the deep ocean, and uh, now, wh why is this happening? Where does it come from? It really has to do with the fact that the world population is growing very, very rapidly. So when I was five years old, there were three billion people on this planet, and there are now more than seven billion people on this planet. And we know that people are emitting carbon dioxide, raising the CO2 levels in the atmosphere, and having various effects on the ocean. But all those people are also demanding more food. They're demanding more energy. They're demanding raw materials. And our advanced economies are also creating a demand for rare earth elements. We use them in solar panels and wind turbines and hybrid cars and so on. Maybe most people don't know, a single Prius battery uses 22 pounds of lanthanum, a rare earth element. So as we deplete, all our resources on land and in coastal waters, we're beginning to look to the deep sea for these resources. Now I mentioned that rising CO2 has effects on the ocean. These are three of the big ones. And I don't really have time in this short lecture to talk in detail, but just to say that the deep ocean is warming. It's changing animal distributions. Um, but it's also potentially um, dissociating methane which is a gas hydrates, which are stable at very high temperatures and pressures. So, so that's one of the effects that we're just beginning to learn about. We know that the deep ocean is becoming more acidic, just as surface waters are. We call that ocean acidification. And this threatens calcifying species, such as the deep water corals that I mentioned are, are so uh, abundant in the Atlantic. And in places where the waters are heavily uh, are more acidic, you get corals without, without skeletons. This is what it looks like in the Eastern Pacific. Um, the ocean is losing its oxygen. We call this ocean deoxygenation. And those of you who are, heard me talk earlier today uh, know that this can affect deep sea diversity. It affects a whole series of ecosystem functions. But what I'd really like to talk about for the rest of this lecture is the direct human influence, uh, which, is, as I mentioned, is increasing, and it's a result of technology. We have new technologies that enable us uh, to document where fish are using satellites, using new mapping tools, using new fishing instrumentation. We can catch fish deeper and deeper. We're developing new mining tools to mine minerals off the seafloor, and we have an amazing array of infrastructure which is allowing us to pump oil and gas from very deep water. So let me start with fish. We are fishing deeper and deeper. Um, as you can see from this diagram, it's now routine after 2000 to take millions of tons, hundreds of millions of tons of fish from below 1,000 meters, and nowhere has this the deepening, the average depth of fish caught increased greater than in Antarctica. Um, and the effects of fishing deep water fish are um, many fold. We are easily overfishing these fish, which as I told you are very old and don't uh, reproduce or recover very quickly. We have a tremendous amount of lost fishing gear that continues to catch fish at the bottom of the ocean even after it's fallen off the boats and is never recovered. We call that ghost fishing. That happens a lot. And we have begun to endanger deep sea species via bycatch. Now, bycatch is the catch of fish not targeted for fishing. They're just incidentally caught in the nets. This is so severe that it turns out of the top 15 deep sea Atlantic species, 
nine of them are already in endangered status without ever being targeted in any fishery. They've just been caught as bycatch. So it's very easy to endanger deep sea fish. But perhaps the biggest effect of fishing, the most damaging effect, I should say, is bottom trawling, which involves draw drawing these large, heavy nets over the seafloor, often in places where there are aggregations of fish, but there are also aggregations of three-dimensional coral. And, these, um, and this can be very damaging. It usually leads to just piles of rubble. So when you re remove that three-dimensional structure, you lose the, all the biodiversity associated with those corals. And something like 20% of our continental margins have been trawled already. This was really brought home to me when I was on a research cruise off the North Island of New Zealand. We were exploring for methane seeps, and we discovered nine new seeps, the first ever found off New Zealand. They were full of undescribed species. Nobody had ever seen them before. And yet, every single one of those sites had been trawled. There were trawl marks, there was coral rubble, there was lost fishing gear. And because New Zealand keeps very meticulous records, we were able to go back and look. And every one of these pluses is a trawl. One of the sites we discovered had been trawled 200 times already. So basically, the biodiversity is being destroyed before we ever discover it. And I think this is being played out around the world on continental margins all over the world as bottom, deep sea bottom trawling continues. Now, I mentioned we're um, drilling for oil and gas increasingly deeper and deeper. And it's now routine to drill at 3,000 meters. So that would be about 9,000 feet, much deeper. Um, there are many different kinds of possible effects. There's a tremendous amount of noise associated with both the exploration and production of oil and gas. There's seismic air guns. There's the operating platforms. There's the pumping and reinjection that goes on. And, and there are marine mammals and fish and probably other organisms that are going to be affected by this noise. Um, this map of Drilling rigs in the Gulf of Mexico shows you, first, that there are a lot. I think there are something like 5,000 oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And um, the size of the circle shows you when they were built. You can see that the most recent ones are all in deep water along here at depths of 2,000, 3,000 meters. And this is the most famous one. Probably some of you know about the Deepwater Horizon, which blew out and spilled tremendous amounts of oil in the Gulf of Mexico. And we have scenes like this. And we're really just now beginning to understand the consequences of spilling all that oil into water. Another extraction activity that's just on the horizon is deep sea mining. And there's a tremendous amount of interest now in the mineral resources that I told you about. Uh, phosphorites are formed in upwelling, very productive regions. You can see mapped here. Um, the first targeted area was off Namibia. Um, and there are lease claims just at depths of two or 300 meters. Now, I was on sabbatical in Namibia in 2011. I was working with the Fisheries Institute, a government institute. And while I was there, my colleagues learned that the mining ministry in Namibia had leased out vast tracts to a phosphate mining company. Turns out those tracks were on site of the most productive Namibian fisheries. And um, I guess, let's see, before I talk about that, let me just point out that there are now other areas that Namibia was first, but uh, they're targeting phosphates off Mexico and off New Zealand. But those productive fisheries in each of these areas, they're, they're in fact upwelling areas with a lot of productive production. But here off Namibia, it turns out that the bacteria that sequester the phosphate also support rich communities of worms, which these gobies, which migrate up, which are fed on Haken horse mackerel, which are Namibia's biggest fisheries. And these fish feed very rich uh, communities of marine mammals and seabirds in the Benguela ecosystem, which is one of the world's most productive ecosystems. So we have the confluence of the mi mining interests and fishing interests. And this is beginning to play out in different areas around the world. 
on margins. I mentioned manganese nodules, which occur in the ocean beneath the central gyres, low productivity regions. Um, this is a map of the clarion clipperton fracture zone just all to um, the west of Mexico. And uh, there are now 16 countries with mining leases on the seafloor here, at depths of three, four, or 5,000 meters. And each of these leases, some of them are the size of small countries. They're absolutely huge. Uh, the, they're leased uh, by the International Seabed Authority to countries that have signed and ratified the law of the sea and have an interest. And I, I haven't listed them all here, but you can see the big range of countries. They're also starting to set aside um, protected areas. That's what these green boxes are, um, are 400 by 400 kilometer um, areas that they want to set aside to not mine. So we are, um, yeah, so, so there's manganese, and I should mention, I didn't really say what people are mining for, but the manganese nodules um, are, are rich in a whole series of metals, manganese and um, nickel and cobalt and also some rare elements. But I think perhaps what's most hot in mining is actually the mining of, of seafloor massive sulfides at hydrothermal vents. So the International Seabed Authority has let claims to lease hydrothermal vents on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the South Indian Ridge. These are all in international waters. But then there are actually hundreds of claims that have been made in uh, the West Pacific Island nations. So country like Papua New Guinea, Tonga, Fiji, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, they have all leased their deep water for mining of hydrothermal vents. Now, um, it turns out probably the very first of that mining, if it happens, will be in Papua New Guinea, where Nautilus Minerals has proposed to mine by 2018. So that's really only a few years away. This is the kind of mining operation that they envision with cutting tools down here. And there are many, many questions, much is unknown about the impacts of mining, and I don't really have time to talk about it except to say that there's a lot of science that needs to be done before we can really manage these types of, of issues. But we are left, and the one other type of mining I mentioned earlier, that seamounts, there's interest in mining cobalt crusts on seamounts, and the International Seabed Authority actually has leased some seamounts in the international North Pacific out, I think, to Russia and maybe China. I, for, I forget which, exactly which two countries it is. So there are all these different mining interests in the deep ocean at this time. No, now, I want to emphasize no mining has taken place yet, but we're kind of on the verge with a lot of claims out there. Now, we're not only interested in taking things out of the ocean, but we do put things into the deep ocean. And uh, we to dump our radioactive waste and our sewage in the deep ocean, but the London Dumping Convention has prevented us now from doing that. However, there is a loophole that allows the deposition of terrestrial mine tailings, and these are very toxic, and now in some countries they're piped down into the deep sea and put on, onto our continental margins at five or 800 meters. This is done in Norway, it's done in Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Chile is thinking about doing this with their copper mine tailings as well. There's also a huge amount of debris that ends up in the deep ocean. Some of it is accidental or incidental. There's, every time there's a tsunami or an earthquake somewhere, massive amounts of material go into deep water. There's huge amounts of plastic, old beer cans, and a lot of trash that comes down rivers, uh, through deep water canyons, and into the deep ocean. But I want to come back to the, to the extraction issues and say, really, what is happening is more or less a haphazard grabbing of resources. The deep sea is being treated like the Wild West. It's a frontier. People are t leasing on a first comes, first served basis. And I have to say that because it's really out of sight and out of mind, most people have no clue that any of this is happening. But it has created a urgent need for what I call deep ocean stewardship. So we are really faced with the question of how do we balance the use of resources with the need to maintain the integrity of deep ocean ecosystems for future generations. This is a real problem. It's made more complex by the varying jurisdictions that we have in the ocean. 
There are over 160 countries with exclusive economic zones with deep water, and each of these has jurisdiction over those waters. And in most of those countries, the fishing sector and the energy sector and the mining sectors are all operated independently by different ministries that don't talk to each other, different agencies. In international waters, the seafloor minerals are, are regulated by the International Seabed Authority, but the water column above it and the fish are regulated by the FAO, and the genetic resources aren't regulated at all. So there are many jurisdictional gaps out there and problems of of jurisdiction. And um, this is really my last slide. I think given everything I've told you, there is a need for um, stewardship. And we have formed an organization called the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. And the goal is really to promote scientific research and observation, to recommend ways to rectify the governance gaps that I've discussed, to develop strategies for ecosystem based management of the deep sea. We try very hard to engage all the stakeholders, which means the industry, regulators, govern, gov, um, governments, they're the regulators, um, the scientists, and civil society. And really, to solve this problem, you need to bring together different kinds of expertise. It's not a question of deep sea biology alone, you know, knowing something about impacts. You really need biologists and economists, policy and law experts. You need technology. You need to understand human behavior and business behavior. And uh, one of our goals is really um, to build capacity in developing nations, because it turns out that the resource extraction happens first in small countries like Papua New Guinea or Namibia, where they have no deep sea biologists. They have no environmental lawyers. They have no policy in place. They're easy targets. And so you know, our goal is to raise awareness, I think, for everybody, but especially those nations to provide needed technology and the kinds of training so that those nations can actually manage their own resources and their own deep sea ecosystems. And for anybody who's interested in knowing more, I, ha I put some flyers out near the exit up back there um, about the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative. And you can sign on to the website uh, and to the mailing list and, and learn a bit more. And so with that, I'd like to stop and thank you listening. I'd be happy to answer questions. I'm going to introduce, we have uh, Jonathan Stillman, who's a professor of biology here at the Romberg Tiburon Center. He studies actually climate change and uh, ocean acidification and global warming on marine organisms. So uh, he studies the physiology of these organisms. He's going to be our moderator tonight. Um, and I'd like to introduce Danielle Desmond, who's one of our graduate students, and she studies population genetics of marine organisms. And I'd like to introduce Crystal Weaver, also, whom actually you were going to do this, right? Oh. <laughs> Let me pass this over. I've, I've taken over. Jonathan. <laughs> so um, Danielle Desmond, who's here to my left, uh, indeed does study population genetics of organisms. Specifically, she's studying uh, fish. The, uh, the rainwater killifish that was introduced into San Francisco Bay, and she's interested in knowing whether the uh, genetic diversity of immune-related genes in this fish uh, give it a stronger ability to be an invasive species. It's a really interesting question. And Crystal Weaver is a graduate student uh, in Catherine Boyer's lab, and she's interested in knowing whether the, uh, the types of microbes in soil, or sediment, I should say, uh, from eelgrass Scientists. beds are important in the success of those eelgrass beds. And if you can figure out which microbes help eelgrass to grow, you could transplant those microbes with eelgrass in, in restoration projects to ensure the success of those beds. And so Crystal and Danielle have prepared some questions for Lisa. And uh, I'm going to try to not moderate their questions, uh, but uh, we'll see how we go. Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I'm thinking about this whole out of sight, out of mind thing about the deep sea. And so I'm, I'm sort of wondering if you had to pick one or two species to be the charismatic representative of deep sea life, which would you choose to help convey the importance of this community to the public, and why? 
okay, you have to realize you're asking studied worms most of their life. <laughs> um, you know, I have to say uh, I've watched different organisms appear on the internet and uh, deep sea animals, and my favorite are the dancing yetis that I just showed you earlier. Um, one of my students wrote, oh, am I not on? Okay. One of my students wrote the first paper and he put the um, movie of their dancing online and it sort of went viral and turned out that 50 different people set the Yeti to modern pop music, <laughs> different songs. <laughs> and uh, I was potentially going to play that for you, which I could do at the end if you want. But, um, you know, just the fact that it caught people's imagination. They're called Yeti crabs, of course, because of all the fur on their claws, which are really bacteria that they're farming. But I think um, the very first Yeti, that was a methane seep Yeti. The very first Yeti did not dance. It was discovered from a hydrothermal vent. But it also got a lot of publicity. People made stuffed animals of it. So I, I'm going to vote for the deep sea Yetis. <laughs> um, so when we have ecologically important species um, suffer harm from human activities, we usually try to take steps to mitigate that harm. So in California, we've been trucking salmon across the dry riverbeds, and in other cases, we're trucking salmon across dams. So in the deep ocean, is there a way to maybe mitigate the issues that we might cause by our extraction activities, by doing preemptive relocation of deep sea organisms. So would this be more of a research interest with an unknown outcome or something that we could feasibly do? My personal opinion is the answer is no, we should not do this. Now, there was a paper written that suggests that perhaps before they mine hydrothermal vents, they should move the snails at Papua New Guinea to another place, move them away, I honestly think it's not going to work, and I think it's going to be extraordinarily expensive. There was a paper that looked at the cost, and it was orders of magnitude more cost than doing restoration in, in shallow water. So we know very little about how to keep, we can't really keep these animals alive. We don't know the conditions they require, and I think we have to, if we want the resources, we have to be willing to lose certain amounts of those ecosystems. I mean, that's a, a personal opinion. I don't think restoration is really feasible. Now, there people have been looking at creating, recreating three-dimensional structure after they've flattened it and putting out cement blocks. And uh, you know, my, I think my comment is that we still can't restore salt marshes very effectively. How in the world are we going to do this for deep sea ecosystems? Well, how far have we come since Alvin, uh, the first passenger carrying deep sea sub, um, submersive uh, that was launched in 1964? Um, what are the new technologies that are giving us better access to studying the deep sea? Well, there are some. I should say Alvin still exists. It was just refit last year, and it's still operating and taking people down to the deep sea, and it has been a great workhorse. It's a, a, so much scientific research has been done. But sending humans down to the deep sea is very expensive, and it's not so time efficient. I mean, it's fascinating to be down there. Probably made 75 Alvin dives or something like that. Um, we are using remote vehicles operated from a surface ship much more. So the remotely operated vehicles allow us to see through video cameras and manipulate and do experiments with manip manipulator arms. We have autonomous vehicles which are sent away and not tethered to a ship. Um, but all we can really do is look with those. And even then we look from a very high Altitude. So for a biologist, they're not so satisfying, but we can measure hydrographic data, we can measure um, you know, temperature and oxygen and uh, maybe methane and sulfide and things like that. Um, another area that uh, has really developed in the last 10 years or so are cabled observatories. We now have observing stations in the deep sea 
that are cabled um, all the way to land so that people can sit in their offices on their desktop computers and take a look at what's happening on the seafloor. <laughs> so that's uh, uh, another interest. And, and they can look at the data being generated. So there are different kinds of sensors out there making measurements. It's very expensive, but it can be done. And let's see, there was one more thing I wanted to mention, and I've forgotten what it is, so maybe I'll have to come back. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, so many deep sea habitats occur in isolated patches. So these are areas of high biodiversity separated from each other by tens to hundreds of kilometers. Um, how do we avoid damaging these biodiversity hotspots with our activities and what issues do we expect if we can mine areas that are in between these habitats, so in biologically unpopulated areas? Okay, well, I guess the first thing I'd like to say is what we call biologically unpopulated simply means that we don't see big, beautiful animals there. Humans are very attuned to charismatic organisms. The um, interest in mining of massive sulfides, they're talking about mining inactive hydrothermal vents, which don't look like much. They look like piles of rocks, but are, I, I, my belief is they actually host specialized communities that nobody's bothered to study yet because they aren't big and beautiful. Uh, and so I think we, we can't make the assumption that what we see as a biodiversity hotspot is the only thing of importance. Okay, so that's just one comment. But um, the way we have to protect the seafloor is to set aside uh, marine protected areas in, in places where we don't know what's there. Because right now, we are leasing out the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Southwest Indian Ridge for, hydro, for vent mining, but all the vents haven't been discovered. What we do know is that there's sort of a regular distance of, um, uh, as you said, they're very patchy, and they might be tens or hundreds of kilometers apart. And so we have to basically start setting aside protected areas for the unknown, as well as the known, assuming that we're going to protect some important seafloor. So I'm going to give uh, Crystal and, and Danielle one more question each. But while we're doing that, you guys can get your thinking caps on and think about questions you might have for Lisa. We'll take those in a minute. Keep that, hold that question. Okay, so this is a personal favorite of mine. Looking back through your career and your research, when was the moment that you realized the urgency in studying the ocean floor, when you really grasped its importance in a way that the general public doesn't yet know? You know, I don't think there was a moment. I, when I was a graduate student um, in 1976, hydrothermal vents were discovered. And to me, that was just fascinating. It changed our understanding of the deep sea. We thought the deep sea was a desert, food poor, you know, f a few organisms, and we discovered all these oases of life. And so, you know, I certainly got interested very early. But my understanding for the need for conservation and stewardship has emerged much more slowly. I was a graduate student in the 70s and really humans weren't in the deep sea doing anything but scientific research. You know, we weren't extracting anything. We weren't fishing very deep. Um, we weren't drilling very deep at that time. So I would say, oh, really, it's the last five years or so I've come to the realization that there's more to do down there than basic science. We have an obligation to develop systems of environmental management down there. Right, next question. Um, so natural disturbance events can wipe out communities that we're familiar with in, on land, like Mount St. Helens, many of you may be familiar with, and also in the deep sea. Scientists have observed hydrothermal vent communities that were once thriving. They come back years later, and the vent has shut off because of geological activities that have ended the flow of water to that area. So what kinds of collaborations between research and industry would allow us to learn how to minimize the damage that we cause uh, by our resource and extraction activities? I think that, so collaborations, I, I think that any activities that 
we do as a society down there, whether it's fishing or mining or taking out oil and gas, need at a minimum to be treated as an experiment. We have an obligation to do appropriate baseline studies before so we know what it is that's out there that we're impacting and any pilot mining programs or any commercial mining that begins, there's an obligation to study the impacts. I didn't really have time to talk about this, but we know very little about what the impacts of deep sea mining will be. There'll be a lot of physical destruction on site, but there'll be sediment plumes that are created that affect a much, much broader area. There might be the release of toxics, there'll be noise, there'll be many other things. And we don't know what those impacts are going to be. So it is our obligation to treat every single activity as an experiment and study in detail what the consequences are and then be adaptable and flexible in revising our regulations to um, incorporate that knowledge. Okay, so we've got our first question over here. She had her hand up first, but I'll continue that. <laughs> no priority. Thank you, thank you. Uh, hello, and thank you for the talk. It was very insightful. Um, I'm, I'm Carly Tilton with Alon Pinnell Realtors, and I have an office here in Tiburon, and I was very curious to, as far as international waters, who signs the rights to mine in these areas of international waters? I thought it was uh, kind of unclear about who owns it and controls it okay, and can lease it out. Question. So. Basically, the countries that have signed and ratified the UN Law of the Sea have a right to those resources. The minerals resources are considered the common heritage of mankind. That means that any company or country, well, any country that makes a claim and mines the resources has to share the wealth gained with all the countries of the world that have signed and ratified the Law of the Sea. And I really, I think there's 160 of them, but I'm not sure exactly. It is useful to know that the US has not, but um, most countries have, many countries have. So um, there is a requirement for benefit sharing of all these min international minerals resources. And the International Seabed Authority is the organization responsible for this, and they haven't yet figured out the payment mechanism for benefit sharing, but they're in the process of trying to do that. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. thank you. It's the same question. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. Excellent. There's the, the area off of Mexico that's been divvied up between the different uh, companies and countries there were several green zones that you cited as areas of non-mining. How did that come about? And was that based on science or some sort of tokenism? Or do you know? Am I asking you to speculate what was on their political minds? I do know. Yeah. I'm happy to tell you. Um, and that's a great question. The International Seabed Authority held workshops and invited scientists to participate and make recommendations about how to protect areas. Now, there's, if you notice, they're around the lease claims. They're not in the middle of the lease claims. So I think what happened is that a lot of um, leases were made, and they're only made to countries, I should say, not to companies, although there are companies representing country, you know, within countries. But um, so the, the team of people that met for the ISA to develop, the, they're called Areas of Particular Environmental Interest, APEIs. For some reason, they won't call them marine protected areas or whatever. But the idea is that they're set aside and not leased. And they conducted a survey of the productivity regimes, the topography. They looked at all the features that are out there, there are seamounts on that seafloor, there's other features, and they tried to select areas that were representative of the different kinds of productivity patterns and the different types of seafloor topography and the different types of manganese nodules that they recognized were out there. So it wasn't random or haphazard, but the fact that they're all around the edges, I think, means that they started a little too late. 
you mentioned an area near New Zealand that had been trawled 200 times or so. Um, I can't see who's talking. Oh, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> maybe I should stand there up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if they just trawled it twice, then you could say that maybe they just were trying it again, you know, but if they trawled it 200 times, they must there, have been finding be something. Fish. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it seems like maybe the, the area is regenerating really quickly. Is that... What do you think? Yeah, some of the area is hard ground, but of course, if they caught their nets, they wouldn't be trawling again. Um, and clearly, the fish are moving in and out. So it might not be that the trawling is a bad thing for the fish there that they're after, but it might, but it still looked like there was a huge amount of damage to the methane seek ecosystems, which are very small, patchy ecosystems. The, pat the, the vents and seep patches are smaller than the size of this room by and large, you know, so it's not very hard to wreck a lot of disturbance and they aren't supporting, well, I, sh I guess I take it back. I was going to say they aren't supporting the commercial fish, but for example, Chile is just, dis in Chile they've discovered the Patagonian toothfish, which are Chilean sea bass, you know, <laughs> on your menu are hanging out at methane seeps, and nobody knows exactly why. They may be um, a source of food. We've discovered shark and egg cases laid all over methane seeps off Chile and in the Mediterranean. They're using them as nursery grounds, even though the adults don't live there. And again, we don't know why. So we still have a lot to discover about these ecosystems. So you know, the trawling may not remove the fish of interest. You're right. Hi, uh, Michael Stocker, Ocean Conservation Research, and thank you. <laughs> Yet another dimension of this whole discussion, I really appreciate your digging into in a deep way. Um, I'm of a mind that there's only one body of water on the planet here, and uh, you talk about methane seeps, you also talk about uh, hydrothermal seeps. Um, there's also cold water seeps, too, and they uh, likely have their sources in terrestrial areas. Um, and fairly deep, particularly in the margins in the OCS, Outer Continental Shelf. I'm wondering if you've given any thought about how that might be disrupted by uh, potential pollutants like fracking or what have you that comes, that goes down three, four, five thousand feet into aquifers that are not necessarily uh, aquifers that we're using to, for our, our water supply, but nonetheless are still part of this body of water and ups, ends up in the ocean. Yeah. The it turns out there, there's a whole array of different types of seeps out there on continental margins. And, um, you know, methane, when I talk about methane seeps, I'm talking about cold seeps, but not necessarily from groundwater seeping out. Those tend to be very shallow, and I'm mostly talking about deeper water systems. Um, but there are asphalt seeps, there's brine seeps, there's just a huge array of seeps on continental margins, all of which support chemosynthetic ecosystems. Um, I'm less familiar with the ones fueled by fresh water, but there is actually methane coming out with groundwater that makes its way into the ocean and out under the shelf and, and up again. Some of it comes out in canyons. I don't know if there's a specific site that you're thinking about, and I really don't know what fracking does to any of it, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, um, slick water, they call slick water, they can polymers which are on the bottom of water which are going, you know, hydrocellular polymers, which are being injected deep into, you know, five, six, seven thousand feet into uh, essentially shale formations. But that, this water down there already, and then somehow that ends up, let's say there's one body of water on the planet, it might be 10,000 years before it gets there, it might be it's, and there are many, and unfortunately, a whole slew of contaminants like that that are making their way into the ocean. Well, thank you for all the new information on the, uh, the deep sea. I'm curious about the effect of uh, what I've come to know about these gyres, or these whirling, whatever, garbage dumps, dead zones yeah. in the ocean. And how does that interact with the deep sea? Does this stuff just fall down and just deposit on the bottom? But what, what is, can you speak to that subject? Okay, so you, you mentioned several different phenomena. The, the Pacific garbage dump that you may have heard about is uh, there's a lot of floating plastic that gets concentrated in certain areas in the open ocean. And um, a lot of 
lot of, some of that does make it down to the deep sea, but it turns out that there's a lot of plastic that gets down there as very tiny particles, as nurdles, which are the things that make, are used to make plastic devices. And I've seen research where they've taken random cores in different parts of the deep sea. I think they went to four very remote places and three of them had plastic nurdles and little tiny pieces of plastic in the sediments. I think it's pretty much getting everywhere, the little plastics. And we don't know, we know that the organisms will eat them and we don't really know the consequences or the ecotoxicology of all of that plastic. So, but the, you know, the, the, the Pacific garbage dump, um, you know, there are big aggregations there. I, and there's a couple places where that occurs. And people are beginning to study what the consequences of that are. Now, you mentioned dead zones. And that's usually a term um, used to apply to low oxygen zones, not associated with plastic. But there are um, naturally occurring low oxygen zones in the ocean. And then humans are helping to make to expand the coastal low oxygen zones as well. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, thanks for a fascinating talk. I was wondering about the stewardship initiative and perhaps you could tell us a little bit about your key partners and what your short-term goals are. Uh, sure, thanks for asking. It's basically a group of, of concerned people um, so many scienti are scientists, but they're not all natural scientists. There's some policy and law experts and some economists and some regulators and industry people and business people. And um, we are not funded, unfortunately. You know, so we just operate on passion. We are a virtual group. We work over the internet. And the kinds of things that we've been doing, we've hold, held AAA S symposia. Um, we write articles about these issues. Um, we've held webinars and seminar series. We've um, gathered expertise and provided input to the International Seabed Authority. We've written letters to them. When they've put out a uh, query to stakeholders, they have one out now, for example, seeking input on environmental regulation. And we'll be gathering input on behalf of, behalf of DOCI and um, writing up a document and submitting to them. Um, we've written briefs for the Global Ocean Commission um, about the deep sea. So we, we try to have input, input and provide advice on environmental management. Now, there are different working groups. And you know, they each have a leader. There's one on deep sea fishing. There's one on oil and gas um, impacts and regulations. And there's one on environmental management that's kind of focused on deep sea mining. Um, we have one on transparency. Uh, one on now on uh, the deep sea tailings placement, the placement of terrestrial mine tailings in the deep sea, because that seems to be ramping up. So wh whenever there's an issue and somebody feels strongly about it, they can start a working group and gather expertise. And you know, our mailing list, I think, is a, probably about 300 strong right now. It's kind of a small group, but it's global and has experts in the deep sea from all around the world who care about these issues. Hi, I'm Heidi Weisko with the Environmental Law Alliance Worldwide, and I've been working with um, some of the attorneys in Baja, California, on the Don Diego um, phosphate mining project. And I'm so glad to hear all of the um, the work that you're putting in. And it was a really great talk. Thank you so much. And I'm my question is, um, I feel like there's a race between the industry and our state of knowledge uh, of you know everything that we need to know before they start mining. And I'm curious what your, in an ideal world, what your pick list of critical scientific questions are that need to be answered before mining can start. Because you said that nothing has happened yet, thank goodness. So I'm curious what your sort of ideal list of questions are. She's asked me what my, what I think the ideal list of what we need to know before we start deep sea mining, what, what kinds of things. And, um, she, and she made a statement, which is very correct, that we're in a race because there's a, a, a rapid rush to claim the resources, but we know very little about the ecology of these systems. And we need to know 
you need to know what's there um, in the way of species. And we need to know what we'll lose if we mine the seafloor and remove those. I actually think that because we're going to be losing the potential for genetic resources, and there's this amazing diversity of microbes and other kinds of organisms there, that the baseline research that happens before mining ought to characterize the services that we are going to lose. So we need to know how much carbon is sequestered and what sequestration capability we're going to eliminate. We need to know what genetic resources are there. Um, we need to know what fisheries service, you know, whether they're nursery grounds or any other services to fisheries, which in Don Diego's case there probably are. She's talking about uh, the Mexico phosphate mining, um, which is under consideration now. I should mention the New Zealand EPA declined the, after reviewing the environmental impact assessment for the Chatham Rise phosphate mining, they declined their request. And so they basically put that mining off, off the table. Um, we need to know about connectivity between the mine site and other sites. And that means we need to know where larvae are going to come from to repopulate and recolonize um, the mined site. And we need to know whether the site that's being mined was an important source of larvae and individuals for other locations. So we need to know, because all of these sites are somewhat patchy, um, how they're connected. We need to know how quickly organisms will recover. One of the things I didn't have time to mention was that hydrothermal vent organisms are not long-lived. They actually grow really quickly, and many hydrothermal vents will form. The communities form, and they'll die all in 10, 20, or 50 years. Whereas the manganese nodule fields, those organisms might be thousands of years old and grow very, very slowly. And once we mine those, they may never recover in the human lifetime. But they're very vast, so maybe we can afford to give up some of them. You know, the, I'm not saying one way or another, but we do have to understand the time scales of recovery and the resilience of these ecosystems before we mine. And the list could go on and on, but she's standing up. But I think I have to <laughs> stop talking. <laughs> OK. Um, I want to uh, really thank Lisa Levin for a really fabulous talk. Thank you very much. I also just want to take a second to thank our fabulous students, Crystal and Danielle and Jonathan, for moderating. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, if you want to mingle for a little while, that's fine. And we hope to see you here again really soon. Thank you very much.